one of the world's ultimate weapons. The samurai bow is a killing machine. But it's also a work of art. Intrinsically linked with the history of this legendary nation. It's been used on the battlefield for millennia and is still an important part of Japanese culture. But bows appear throughout history the world over. And the English longbow is also heralded as a masterpiece. Putting both bows to the test, we'll crown the champion. And reveal the elite warriors master craftsman and ancient philosophy behind the samurai bow built to kill. Weapons have been around since prehistoric times. Now a bullet can kill you before you've even seen who's fired it. But in medieval times you could see the whites of your enemy's eyes. Swords developed through the ages, and the samurai sword is beyond compare. But a lesser known fact is that the samurai's principal weapon was the yumi, or Japanese bow. In the early years of the samurai, the bow was their principal weapon. It was their most highly valued and prized weapon. The art of the samurai was the way of the horse and the bow. The sword was secondary. Just like European knights, the samurai were elite fighters. Paid by the shogun or feudal lords, they were given riches, land, and fame. But in return, they pledged an allegiance so strong that it sometimes cost them their lives. These samurai soldiers were not afraid to die, but their martial training made them almost invincible. Hakata, 1281. Samurai archers face 140,000 Mongol invaders armed with explosives. The samurai won the day. Japan was helped by the kamikaze, or wind of the gods, which destroyed many Mongol ships. But regardless of this divine intervention, the bow had now earned its place in Japanese legend. The Yumi is unique amongst war bows and stands apart from bows in the rest of the world, but its ethos was remarkable too. Samurai trained to fight other samurai of the same standing, hoping to achieve an honorable death at the hands of an equal. And the Yumi was the weapon used to kill a worthy opponent. <laughs> This is the wasashi arrow. It is very important. You wouldn't use this easily. When you spot it in an enemy general or another high-ranking officer, then you would declare your name. You fire the arrow, and if it struck and the man died, people would declare it was an honorable death. But in England, bows were the weapons of the masses. Every man between the ages of 16 and 65 owned a longbow and practiced with it every Sunday. So in really, it was a form of militia that could be called up in time of war. It was our Second Amendment. We made people own bows. A different ethos, but the same weapon. So how can we discover which one was the ultimate bow of the Middle Ages? This is the Wiltshire Ballistics Range in the UK.
Here they put state-of-the-art firearms through their paces. But the same equipment can be used to look at more ancient weapons. To make a fair comparison of the Yumi with the longbow, we've chosen bows with matching draw weights. Both these bows take approximately 23 kilos of force to pull to their maximum. So what is the biggest difference between these two ancient weapons? And what does it mean for their performance? The most obvious difference between a Yumi and a longbow is the shapes. A Yumi is a recurve bow. That means when it's not strung, the bow is actually flexed away from where the string would be. When you string the bow, it's coming to rest there. That means when you let go of it, the bow actually wants to finish there, but the string's stopping it. And that means when you let go of the arrow, the, the limbs and the string is going faster to a point of rest, which means there's more energy in the arrow. The speed at which the arrow leaves can be measured by our high-speed camera. We know how long the arrows are, and by measuring the speed at which they leave the screen, we can work out their velocity. The Japanese bow shoots its arrow at 34 meters per second. That's about 122 kilometers per hour. So how does the longbow compare? Incredibly, it shoots its arrows at 34 meters per second too. So what's really going on? The answer lies in the weight of the arrows. These Yumi arrows are heavier because they're longer, which means they take more power to launch. So the Yumi bow does have more punch for the same draw weight. And if the arrows weighed the same, it would be shooting faster. The Yumi is a composite construction, so it's made of different materials, and it has a recurved tip. The longbow is generally made from a single piece of wood and its ends don't reflex away from the string. The shape makes a difference in the speed of the uh, string coming back to rest. That makes a difference to the speed of the arrow and the energy going towards the target. Another effect of the Yumi design is that its arrows are supposed to leave in a straighter line. But technique comes into play here too. The main difference you have between shooting a Yumi or longbow is the way it's drawn. The longbow you're drawing with your fingertips. So you're drawing it back and it's generally to the side of your face, maybe to the side of your mouth. With a Yumi, you're drawing with your thumb. They're holding the string with your foot with your side of your thumb. And you're drawing that and that natural position becomes almost with level with your ear and behind your ear. The way you put the arrow on the bow is slightly different. With the uh, longbow, it goes across your fingertip. With the Yumi, you're shooting across your thumb. And again, it's the way that the string is coming off. If with a long bow, as you let go of the string, the strings will come back to the center of the bow. So you have the arrow on that side, so the arrow is being pushed into the bow. With a Yumi, it's being drawn the other way. It's going to push into the side of the bow, so the arrow is going across your thumb. So it helps stabilize the arrow to shoot more accurately. Filmed at more than 2,000 frames per second, we can see the longbow arrow veer off course before swinging back to target. But the Yumi arrow flies straight. Shot from the ground, the Yumi outperforms the longbow. And in the hands of the samurai, it was lethal. But the Yumi also had a turn of pace which its competitors could only dream of. Because its archers 
were the cavalry. Today, mounted archery is still held in high esteem. And in our more peaceful times, ceremonial displays have taken the place of battles. But the skills needed to take part in such a ceremony are extreme. And only two schools in the whole of Japan train mounted archers. This is the Ogasawara School. It was established over 800 years ago. But it is still run by the head of the family, Master Ogasawara. Surprisingly, there are no horses here. An archer must be able to ride any mount. So they train to develop ultra-strong leg muscles in preparation. Walking flat-footed, pulling the leg up and pushing it forward only with the inner thigh concentrates the effort in the muscles needed to grip and steer a galloping horse. Master Ogasawara is a strict teacher and his son Kiyomoto is one of his students. I'm actually currently in my last year of study for a doctorate in biology. This takes up almost all my time, even weekends. But there are Ogasawara events and training almost every week too. So compared to other students, I have no free time. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit gives you access to a growing range of documentaries presented by and featuring historians at the forefront of research and debate. Whether you are looking to find out more about charismatic leaders like Cleopatra or to discover the story behind the Industrial Revolution, History Hit will have something for you. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and absolute history fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Today, mounted archery is for display and ceremony only. And in the run-up to the most important ceremony, called Yabusame, training has to move outside. Traditionally, a wooden horse is built to allow the archers to practice and hone their skills in safety. The turning circle helps the archer become accustomed to the movement of a real horse, galloping at over 60 kilometers per hour. Kiyomoto has to keep his balance and reload every five seconds. This practice is all about his riding position. The archer must float on the horse's back, breathing in perfect harmony with the movements of his body. Hitting the target is less important than his posture. Although horses are a rarity, the archers do get some time to practice riding in the run-up to the Yabusame ceremony. It may be a practice session, but Kiyomoto still wears the hunting costume of the samurai. Every element is traditional but practical. The deerskin chaps are light but hard-wearing. And the sword is ready for use at his side. The unusual hat was used to tie up the samurai's hair and keep it out of his eyes. Once everything's in place, targets are erected on the course. The Yabusame track is approximately 250 meters long and has three wooden targets spaced at even intervals. The idea is to hit each with an arrow steering the horse with your legs while at full gallop. His posture is excellent, but his hit rate is average.
I wouldn't say that I'm nervous, but of course I'm expected to hit all my targets. So I have to live up to that. The Yabusame is not a competition. It's a display. But one of the most important Yabusame events of the year is not far away. And Kiyomoto wants to succeed. It's his chance to bring honor to his family. The title of Master Bowman has been passed down through family generations for almost a thousand years. But it's not just the use of the bow which is rarefied and respected in Japan. The manufacture of them is too. Master Kikunaga is a craftsman of supreme talent. His bows are known throughout the country and he uses only the best materials to create them. Every winter, when the bamboo is at its driest, Master Kikunaga and his wife leave his workshop and go in search of the perfect trees. It is hard to find a nice big copse of dry karatake bamboos. We were fortunate to have been told about these by an acquaintance. But even when there are so many bamboo trees, it's rare to find the right bamboo for a bow. Each tree will make one bow, and they have to have specific qualities. It can't have any scratches, and the length between the knots need to be the right size. There are many bamboos here, but it is really hard to find the right one for a bow. Master Kekunaga has found three suitable trees, and they're cut into slats and then taken for drying. This smoking chamber will house the bamboo for the next six months. In the mountains of Suwano, in southwest Japan, a religious ceremony is underway. The Yabusame event, which Kiyomoto Ogasawara has been training for, has arrived. But before it starts, a ritual blessing takes place. First, the bows are blessed. Then the archers drink sake to cleanse themselves. The archers will return to the temple after the Yabusame to tell the gods how they did. But for now, all eyes turn to the course. Both Japan's mounted archery schools perform a Yabusame, but this is an Ogasawara school display. It's a particularly difficult course. As in other places, there are three square wooden targets to hit. But here, at Suwano, the track is short, so there's less time to hit them. Kiyomoto Ogasawara is here with his father. But they have a while to wait until it's his turn. 12 archers are taking part today, and they'll each have three attempts. For some, this is their first time, and at full speed, the nerves and inexperience start to show. It may not be a competition, but everyone's watching. As soon as an archer loses his posture, there's no way he can hit the target. Mm -hmm. 
in Yabusame, we don't feel like competitors. It isn't about which individual is the best. The event itself is more important. Everyone tries to perform to the best of his ability. Finally, Kiyomoto's ready. With the traditional cry of Inyo, Inyo, which means darkness and light, he looses the arrows. But he's missed twice. And he's worried about his horse. These horses are not the ones we normally ride. We rode them for the first time yesterday. There aren't many horses that are suited to the sport, but that's just the way it is. The fan signals Kiyomoto can start his final attempt. Hit one. Hit two. Hit three. It's a clean sweep. His dedication and practice has paid off. Kiyomoto Ogasawara has hit all three targets. He's the only archer to have achieved it all day. The young rider has managed to do what his father expected. Of course he's expected to hit all the targets. Why wouldn't he? So I talked him through it during the break, and then he managed it. The master always expects the best from his students. It's how to achieve perfection. But the gods of Tsuwano should be happy with Kiyomoto today. It's been six months since Master Kekunaga put the bamboo slats into his smoker for drying. And the precious wood is ready. The craft of making a yumi has remained the same for centuries. The modern yumi takes its shape from a very early period. There are bows surviving in temples in Japan which come from the second century. The shape of those bows are almost identical to what those are used today. The construction of the bows is very different because those bows are made of a single piece of wood, whereas the bows today have been composites. They're made of different materials, different types of wood. Look, this is how it has to be. The joints of the lathe must face each other precisely. The darker wood is for the inner side of the bow, and it's extremely hard. The lighter parts of the bamboo are very soft, and will therefore be used for the outer edges of the bow. In the mid-section of the bow, darker smoked bamboo is used. The outer edge is also made of haze, a Japanese hardwood. All three pieces must complete a set before I can smooth them to the right strength. Because each piece of bamboo is different, Master Kekunaga must work out how thick it needs to be to achieve the flexibility he needs. Fractions of a millimeter can make a difference. And it takes years to truly understand how the wood feels and moves. Too thick, and it won't bend enough. Too thin, and it will break. Once all three sections are the perfect thickness, the bow is glued and bound with a manila rope. The crisscrossed rope holds the pieces together and is the key to how the bow is bent. Before the glue dries, 
small pieces of bamboo are forced under the rope. These are used to hold the position of the bow once Master Kekunaga starts to bend it. The bow is bent, gently at first. Then forced a little further. In tiny steps, it takes shape. Eventually, achieving the perfect curve. The truly unique thing about the Yumi, its asymmetric shape, is what makes Master Kekunaga's job even more difficult. The top part of the bow is twice as long as the bottom, so the grip is about two-thirds of the way down. No other bow is made like this, and there are many theories as to why. This is a Japanese bow. Its midpoint is here. But the grip is actually down here, on the lower third of the bow. The reason for this is simple. When you fire an arrow, then the shock waves you feel in your wrist due to the rebound are the strongest in the middle. This is why bows in Japan are built with grip in the lower third of the bow. As well as its shape, the Japanese bowmen have another technique to increase the Yumi's power. Called the Tsunomi, the hand of the archer moves at the last moment so that the arrow doesn't have to bend around the bow, but flies straight from the string. First, it corrects the path of the arrow that would otherwise drift off course on the way to the target, as well as that the arrow gets an extra kick and flies faster. And on top of that, it ensures that the arrow flies on a straight line and doesn't oscillate as much. More power, a straighter flight, and fewer oscillations out of the bow sounds like the perfect combination. But what really matters with a bow is how deadly it is at impact. And to test this, we need to apply some ballistics techniques. Using modern equipment to test the power of the European longbow against the Yumi, which bow will reign supreme? The ultimate objective of a bow is, is to disable an enemy, putting a man out of action. And that happens by the, the force at which the arrow hits him, the, the energy delivered, which either penetrates the armour, or even if it doesn't penetrate, the amount of smack and hit that it delivers. The power depends on how fast the arrow leaves the bowstring, its weight, and also how much drag slows it down. Because the Yumi and the longbow arrows are made with different materials, they will have a different impact. But which has the most power? I think the Yumi's going to have the greater penetration power, simply the fact being that it's a recurve. That means the string's going to come back to rest faster, the arrow will have a greater speed, and I think that speed is going to make a bigger difference as the arrow goes into the target. This is a block of ballistics gel, normally used to test bullets. It's the same density as human flesh, so will give us a measurement of how deep each arrow would penetrate a person. Filming with the high-speed camera shows us the moment of impact, and the Yumi arrow makes a huge impression. 
This shot would have gone right through a human thigh. The longbow is also impressive. But it doesn't make quite the same inroads as the Yumi. Almost 25 centimeters into the gel for the longbow versus 30 for the Yumi. But both shots clearly could have been fatal. Both bows were deadly. But the Yumi had a unique role on the battlefield. In early feudal times, Japanese battles were traditional and followed certain rules. The fighters were both samurai, but to ensure they were of equal standing first, each would proclaim his heritage. Perhaps it was hoped that ritualized battles would act as a last resort to prevent mass slaughter. If one side were intimidated, the battle would be conceded. If not, then war was waged. Respect, courage, and battle prowess are synonymous with the samurai, and the Yumi had a distinct role to play in the wars they fought. Although the bow isn't used in battle today, it's still an important part of Japanese culture and nowadays has more of a religious significance. But this spiritual element originated early on. In the year 1103, legend tells of an evil spirit which settled on the imperial palace. It was only the power of a samurai's bow which drove out the demon. Today, the Yumi is still called upon to perform cleansing rites in a tradition which passes through Japan's archery aristocracy. And at the Meiji Jingu Shrine in western Tokyo, Ogasawara archers are preparing to rid it of mischief. Leading the procession is Kiyotada Ogasawara, head of the family. In 1187, one of my ancestors was commissioned to teach mounted archery to the shogun Minamoto no Yoritomo. The Ogasawara family became teachers and masters of ceremony at the court of the shoguns through the various dynasties until the mid-19th century. Only archers of the highest caliber take part in ceremonies, and their skill is indicated by the black rattan wrapping on their bows. First, the gods are asked to offer their strength, and a special arrow is prepared called a kabura-ya, which whistles when it's shot. The sound travels to the four corners of the shrine, and evil is banished again. The Yumi is closely linked with many aspects of Japanese history, and great care is taken to preserve its traditions. Back in Master Kikunaga's workshop, bows are made in the age-old way, and his latest is ready for stringing. Gently, it's bent over a rack, 
and a piece of steel cable is tied at both ends. When Master Kikunaga holds the finished article in his hands, he finally knows if it's a good Yumi. This looks good. It's all about balance. There has to be a balance between the upper and lower arms. Or else, it isn't a good ball. No two bows are the same, and for Master Kikunaga, each one has a different character. His bows are so special that finding a suitable name for them was difficult, and he even sought some divine intervention. We opened the dictionary and looked at a lot of names. We took a selection to a monk. He offered up prayers and then told us that we should choose the symbol Taido, or Luminous Way. We didn't suggest this to him at all, but he thought that the name would bring us luck. So now our bows are called Taido. The Japanese connection to the Yumi is linked to their spirituality and heritage, but the heyday of the bow has passed. There was a time in the Middle Ages when every samurai clan had a school dedicated to the art of war. These schools were shrouded in secrecy, and now many have disappeared. But in the heart of Japan, a school still exists which teaches the ancient way of the bow. The foot a little farther back, like so. And don't forget, for a long shot, you need to go wide and big. You must always hold the bow at a slight angle, like that. In an attack, this means you have the chance to fend off the incoming arrows. It is important not to lift your arms up too much. As this opens up, the armor and the heart is no longer protected. So you need to keep your arms low. Tomorrow we will be wearing the armor too. It weighs about 20 kilograms. The weight really puts a strain on your legs. A few times a year, the school gets together for a display of archery in full battle armor. The costumes are all authentic. The samurai had no shields and relied on plates in their clothes, which only gave limited protection. Maneuverability was more important. The arrows used here are all of the same type, but in the Middle Ages, archers would pack an array of arrows with different specialities. There are some types of arrowheads that were only chosen when the target was in sight. If the enemy was hit, its comrades could certainly pull the arrow out, but the head would remain stuck in the body. These arrowheads are called karimata. Their inner size can cut like a knife. If you were hit by one of these, you could easily lose an arm. It's gruesome, isn't it? As 
as well as the arrows and the plates in their clothes, the archers' other defense came from their attack formation, moving forward in two rows. While the first line of archers move forward and fire, the second have time to reload. And this is how the archery formation engages with the enemy, one section at a time. Finally, he uses this ball like a spear and charges the target. The samurai's war formation, arrows and armor made them a formidable fighting force. And even without their horses, when forced to fight from the ground, they showed discipline and great skill. But ground combat was normally the preserve of the European archer. So, in a ballistics range, when pitted against medieval armor of mail and plate, how will the Yumi and the Longbow compare? Up until the middle of the 13th century, up until about 1250, European armour was pretty much exclusively male. That is, interlocked web of rings, each closed with a little rivet. And that is worn over an akaton or a hobojon, a thick padded garment. The longbow archer was familiar with mail and his arrows were specially designed with long, thin, armor-piercing ends called needle bodkins. From a direct shot, the male puts up little resistance. The Yumi was more often pitted against plate armor, so what happens when an arrow made for piercing plate runs into European mail? Despite the Yumi's superior penetration power, without a bodkin-style arrow more prevalent in Europe, it can't defeat mail. Both archers would have chosen their arrows carefully but the Japanese had plates of iron as defense against early medieval arrows. So how do our 23 kilo bows fare against this? The Yumi has no problem. So what about a longbow bodkin arrow? Both arrows successfully pierce it. A direct hit can defeat the Japanese armor. With the advent of firearms in the 16th century, the bow became less relevant on the battlefield. But that didn't mark the end of the samurai. They were still an important part of Japanese society. And the samurai wanted a way to maintain their skills. So they created a competition at Sanjo Sangendo, a famous temple in Kyoto. This competition was not just about skill, but also about determination. As well as hitting the target, archers had to compete solidly for 24 hours. The record set in 1686 saw a samurai shoot more than 13,000 arrows with over 8,000 on target. A truly astonishing feat. Archery had become a demonstration of mental strength and practically a religion. Zen Buddhism came to Japan in the 12th century. It teaches the importance of concentration and offers a way to understand life and not to fear death. The samurai were naturally drawn to it. 
In our lives, we judge everything. We classify things as good or bad, as being frightening or something you love. But this way of classifying things blinds us to the true nature. In the state of Mushin, you are free and learn not to cling to your desires. Mushin is a moment of high concentration, where thoughts no longer cloud the mind and everything becomes clear. It's a state which martial artists strive to achieve because it allows your body to react intuitively without any distractions from your mind like fear or anger. Mushin is practiced through meditation, but also through any repetitive task on which you can focus and practice clearing your mind while concentrating. A calm, clear mind, able to fight intuitively, must have been a formidable combination for the samurai. Master Inoue's school of Kyudo on the outskirts of Tokyo. This is a different kind of archery school. No battle cries sound here. The place has an air of absolute serenity. Master Inoue teaches archery as a martial art form. Kudo, it's a martial art. In Japan, it's pursued as a martial art. But Q is for bad archery. Do is an art. It's very much an art form. It's very graceful movements. It's a very slow and methodical process. And it has been likened to a ballet. Kudo is practiced by men and women, both young and old. In fact, in Japan, almost half of all the practitioners are female. It's about concentrating on yourself, on your movements, and not focusing on the target and your desire to hit it. The makiwara is a tightly bound drum of straw. It's a practice target, which helps the archers to take their mind away from what they're shooting at and bring their concentration back to themselves. It's a different way of thinking, but in a Kudo school, the target is just a distraction. Standard Kudo is practiced over a 28 meter course, so there's no need to draw heavy bows. It's not a show of strength, but control and precision. And some of the very best archers are women. Kimi Ijima has been a student here for two years. If you focus on hitting the target, you will always miss. The aim is to hit the target without trying to. It's incredibly hard, but it's also fascinating. But how can you achieve something without wanting to? If you will yourself to hit the target, your mind will be upset and this will disturb your shot. Of course, the target will tempt you to aim straight for it. But the more you practice, the more you will learn to withstand this temptation. At some point, the right moment to release the arrow will come to you entirely naturally, and you will hit the target. With total concentration and presence of mind, the students learn that the target will be hit without trying to hit it. And some will come to the self-realization that archery can be a path to enlightenment. The Japanese bow has led archers down many paths. To war. to enlightenment, to honor and death. For speed and power, it is without equal among medieval longbows. And with
was capable of delivering a fatal blow, even to armored soldiers. But in modern Japan, the Yumi is more than just a killing machine. A work of art, a link to the spirit world, and a connection to a glorious past. The samurai bow is truly an ultimate weapon, built to kill.